versus Burwell case, the plaintiffs were asking the court to invalidate an IRS regulation that provided that tax credits are available to individuals purchasing health insurance through federally operated exchanges. So to give some background, um, the Affordable Care Act provides that each state shall have an exchange through which individuals and small businesses can purchase health insurance. Um, now the statute also says if a state doesn't itself set up one of these state exchanges, the federal government will step in and establish and operate that state exchange. Um, the statute also says that tax credits, or sometimes called premium subsidies, will be available to all individuals whose incomes are between 100% and 400% of the federal poverty line. But then the statute, in the part that sets forth the formula for calculating the individual's tax credit, um, refers to the individual enrolling in a health plan through an exchange established by the state. So the plaintiffs in the case focused in on that language and said, aha, this means that tax credits are only available in state-operated exchanges. So the stakes in this case were very significant because in about two-thirds of states, including Texas, these exchanges are operated by the federal government. So there's almost seven million people that have been getting tax credits to help with the purchase of health insurance um, through the federal exchanges, um, including over 800,000 people here in Texas. So I think as most of you know, the government won. Okay, so tax credits still are available to all individuals um, in the, those relevant um, income limits. So the, the plaintiff had asked the court to focus very narrowly on those words, an exchange established by the state. And the majority said, no, we don't read words, statutory language in isolation. We read statutory language in context. We look at other provisions of the statute, and we look at the statutory purpose. And so that means language that might on its face seem clear, it can become ambiguous when you look at the broader context. And the majority said, this is one of those cases. So the majority gave maybe two sentences to the plaintiff's argument and said, yeah, I guess if you look at this language really literally, you know, maybe it says tax credits are only available in states. Um, but they said, you know, we're also going to look at some other provisions of the statute. And these other provisions seem to clearly contemplate that these tax credits would also be available in the federally operated exchanges. And so they spent really pages talking about these other provisions, and they very closely followed the government's arguments that it made in its brief. So the court then said, okay, looking at the context there, it makes ambiguous this language that maybe, arguably, is clear on its face. Um, so having concluded that the language is ambiguous, you might have thought the court said, okay, we're going to apply the Chevron two-step analysis, but as a, my colleague, Professor Chan, will talk about, they didn't do that. And they said, no, we, the court, get to decide what this statute means. So they said, okay, the language is ambiguous, so we're going to take another step back, and we're going to look more broadly at the statutory purpose. And specifically, we're going to ask whether the plaintiff or the government's interpretation is incompatible with the law's overarching purpose. And here they concluded that the plaintiff's interpretation would indeed frustrate the law's ultimate goal of trying to reduce the number of uninsured individuals in this country. Um, so their reasoning here was based on just general economic principles. They said, look, the Affordable Care Act sets forth three key reforms, and these reforms are interrelated. So the first thing that the statute does is it reforms the underwriting process for health insurance. And specifically, it prohibits health insurers from considering an individual's health status when making enrollment decisions or when setting premiums. And this is necessary to make sure that anyone who wants to buy health insurance is actually able to do so. The problem with having that underwriting reform stand on its own is it also encourages healthy people to wait until they are sick to buy health insurance. Because they know when they get sick, they can still go out and buy health insurance. So the concern is that we would then have four sort of uh, uh, these insurance pools with less healthy people. Health insurers would then raise premiums to account for that. That would encourage even more people to delay buying health insurance. And we'd end up in this so-called death spiral that would result in instability of um, the insurance markets and in states. So to address this con 
Congress adopted a second key reform. It said, okay, we're going to require everyone to buy health insurance, including healthy people that maybe don't want health insurance, or you're going to be subject to a penalty if you don't do so. Okay, that's the very controversial individual mandate. And then the third, Congress said, well, if we're going to require everyone to buy health insurance, we've got to make sure that people can afford it, so we're going to have these tax credits in place. And so the court said, look, if you take away the tax credits, you're going to have this so-called death spiral. Why would that happen? Well, because there's this important exception to the individual mandate. Um, you are not subject to the individual mandate if health insurance is unaffordable given your income. So if you take away those tax credits, it's suddenly unaffordable for most people. So with no tax credits and not being subject to the individual mandate penalty, the concern was a lot of people would then drop out and we have that so-called death spiral. So the court said, look, you know, the plaintiff's interpretation would just destabilize markets, um, these insurance markets and states with these federally operated exchanges. We really doubt that's what Congress meant to do, so government wins. Okay. Um, so I'll just touch really briefly on Justice Scalia's dissent. Um, it was a very colorful dissent, and I, and I think really the opening, the opening paragraph says it all. He says, you know, when the court holds that when the Affordable Care Act says, exchange established by the state, it means exchange established by the state of the federal government. Uh, that is, of course, quite absurd. And that was pretty much his take. I mean, he focused very narrowly on the language. So um, before I turn these over to my colleagues, just, you know, con concluding thoughts, um, I think the majority's approach here is acknowledging that the process for drafting legislation is often an imperfect one. Um, so, you know, Dean Burke mentioned that I was an attorney at HHS uh, before coming here to the University of Houston Law Center. And I can tell you that most of the statutes that I um, worked on had some provisions that were imperfectly drafted. There would be inconsistent use of terminology, which I think is what was really happening in this case. There would be outright mistakes, such as cross references to sections that didn't exist. Um, so I think the court was sort of acknowledging this reality and saying, you know, we're not going to follow this really rigid approach to interpreting statutes. You know, we're not going to allow sloppy drafting to trump what Congress meant when, from the context and from the, you know, the broader statutory purpose, we know what Congress meant. Um, and to do otherwise would frustrate the fundamental democratic principle of self-governance through our um, elected representatives. 